All right. So category cabling is the uh, um, is the topic for today. Now this is week eight right now in uh, 2024 uh, network cabling uh, class. And week eight we have some topic that actually involves the word cabling in the course uh, that is called network cabling. Yay! All right. Uh, I wish I had uh, one of those uh, one of those sparkly thingies that are produced on the screen, but I don't uh, with the press of a button. I think it's uh, done by Elgato Stream Deck or something like that. They have those kind of things. But anyways, I digress. Um, all right. So um, in the main picture, you see the well. You see a lot of cables here. Now. I took this picture in one of the ma um, in one of the major cable distribution uh, cable TV distribution uh, centers. This is not data. Uh, these are not data cables. However, if we pretend that they are data cables, would you be able to spot anything that is wrong with this picture here? if this were data cables well um <clears throat> i shouldn't pretty much expect you to know right away but i wanted i want to bring your attention towards something here not these not as these uh, tiny well are those zip ties or are those maybe they're even those twisties here look how they are biting into the wire with every pressure point like that, the physical structure of the cable is compromised. So any kind of cable is going to be affected. Some cables more than others. Uh, it is not the greatest idea when it comes to coaxial cables, which these are. Uh, but if there were data cables, then there would be definitely a no-no uh, uh, to bind the cables like this. Because right? uh, with every physical structure, every physical deformation like that, you're changing the specifications of the cable. You're changing the capacitance, you're changing the inductance, you're changing what, well, some parameters more than others. But uh, how this thing is affecting the cables, we're just going to get to uh, right now, all right? very soon. What should we do? Because so I shouldn't be telling you, well, what's good me telling you what should not be done if I don't give you the um, information on what actually should be done. All right, so data, what did I write here? Data cable bundles should be bound with velcro tape now you're going to see a lot of zip ties still in the industry and well now uh please uh, i'm just going to uh, i'm, I'm I'll, i will expect some negative comments if this is well, when this thing is posted on youtube saying that yes sometimes you can bind things with zip ties All right but, uh, you know, hold your horses, uh, wonderful people around the world. Uh, because uh, I'm going to tell you this. If you know what you're doing, you can, up to some point, use zip ties. Yes, just to cover all the bases and just in case somebody does something wrong, there is that general perception of no zip ties with data cables whatsoever, no absolutely not sacrilegious against any kind of human values or what no okay well and I, I part of me a large part of me agrees with that right because if you want if you you know if you, if you can if you can establish some sort of a rule that uh, that's going to be across the board and uh, it's going to help the whole industry all together yes I, I do agree with that however let's uh, not kind of like tie ourselves into a knot uh, because sometimes you will be able to use zip ties. However, you're going to have to use them very knowledgeably and hopefully I'm going to give you some of the knowledge that you can avoid some mistakes and some troubles in the future. Right. All right, so here's the concept number one. Data bundles should be bound with Velcro always and not only Velcro, but soft side in. That's how sensitive 
data cables can be. By saying that, I'm going to say CAD3, which is obsolete by now, is not going to care much about that kind of stuff. CAD5E, and we're going to look at some of the specifications and differences in, during this lecture uh, between the di different designations of the, of the cables or parameters. CAD5E stands for, e stands for enhanced, uh, is going to care somewhat about how you bind those cables. And you can, with CAD5E, you still can get away with binding the, the, those bundles with, uh, with zip ties. Velcro is the best, absolute best. Right? And then soft side in. Then you're safe all across the board. Now, when it comes to CAD6 and up, then those cables will care a lot how you bind them, how you arrange them, and how you treat them. Okay, so here are some examples of Velcro. You can buy the Vel you know, can buy Velcro in bulk, and when you're doing, you're, you're dressing up some sort of installation, it's a good idea to have Velcro at hand at all times. All right? Remember, soft side in. This is wrong right here. I took that from one. Uh, took this picture from somewhere on the internet, and uh, somebody was demonstrating. You know, they did a pretty good job, um, sort of. Uh, but I noticed that uh, they didn't put soft side in, which is not going to matter that whole of a lot. But um, well, if you want to do it, do it right. Okay. Now here, let's get uh, let's get some concepts out of the way. And for some of us, this might be a review. Some of us must be a new might be a new concept. Let's just uh, get ourselves in, uh, on the same page. Uh, so if somebody's watching and getting this thing, this idea for the first time, then uh, please enjoy it. All right. Let's say this is a conductor, and it's a cutover the conductor, and it is connected somewhere on one end, and it's connected somewhere else on the other end. And let's say this is a part of a complete circuit. Okay. And let's say that there is a current flow happening in this conductor. When there's a current, there is going to be a magnetic field around the conductor. The magnetic field does have a direction. And now I'm just going to say this. I just have to, we just have to establish something. Conventional current flow or electron flow. We are, right now, with this explanation, we are assuming the convention of the conventional current flow, which means we are assuming, and yes, it is okay to assume, uh, we, have, we are establishing the idea that the current flows from positive to negative. And when, I'm just going to say that, it can argue this way, that way, or whatnot, uh, whether, well, you know, electrons flow this way, you know, so it should be, this, this should be that, all right? Okay, when it comes to, sometimes, you know, you just have to set sometimes some limitations to the whole inertia or the whole system. If you assume electron flow, calculate the whole thing using the electron flow direction, and you're going to get correct results. But if you assume that you're going to use the conventional current flow, do all the calculations with the conventional current flow, and you also are going to get correct results. Sometimes some of the arrows are going to be pointing the other way, but the parameters and the calculations and the results you're going to get, just you assume one way and stick to it from the beginning to the end while you're performing certain calculations. The calculation set, all right? All right, so, assuming the conventional current flow, which is from positive to negative, then we're going to have electromagnetic field. Yes, you're going to have electromagnetic field, but we're concentrating on the, this, this, these little circles. These are the magnetic field, all right? And they do have a direction. 
if you can if you use the conventional current flow they are going to have that type of a direction right there so if this is a you know i use the corkscrew analogy uh righty tidy if you don't know which way the corkscrew turns just go and get yourself a bottle of wine and a corkscrew and then find out uh, and call it a science experiment yeah okay <laughs> uh, so uh but when you turn the corkscrew to the right the corkscrew is going to move forward which will be the direction of the current and the direction of turning the corkscrew uh, is going to be the direction of the magnetic field with the conventional current flow all right we have established that so far now let's say we're going to have another conductor right beside it and that conductor is not going to be connected to anything or if you want if you really want to be cute about that you can connect one end to a wire and another here and another wire here and just put a little tiny resistor if you want you're going to have some sort of a circuit passive not powered not connected to any power supply this one here is connected to some sort of power supply and we have some sort of a current established here what is going to happen if this conductor finds uh, itself within a close proximity close enough to the active conductor the magnetic field is going to affect that and it is going to cause a current flow in the other conductor it's called induction that's how transformers work so in case of a transformer this is something that we want to accomplish right we use it to our advantage however sometimes uh, this phenomenon can work against us and this is what we're going to be talking about uh, well if this is a signal telephone signal uh, well and there is a one pair of conductors here somewhere and there's another pair of conductors and if those wires are straight and close enough to each other this can happen you can actually hear if this is an analog transmission you can actually hear the other convers the other conversation in the other on the other line and that is called a crosstalk right what is a crosstalk in electronics crosstalk is any phenomenon by which a signal transmitted on one circuit or channel of a transmission system creates an undesired effect in another circuit or channel crosstalk is usually caused by undesired capacitive inductive or conductive coupling which is joining uh, from one circuit from one channel to another in structured cabling electromagnetic interference from one or you can say magnetic interference from one pair to another so basically what this means if we have two transmission lines two circuits close to each other and if the wires are straight right, so the magnetic field has enough strength to affect the other wire then the crosstalk happens crosstalk is a signal bleeding from one circuit to another and in communications this is something that we are trying to prevent we are trying to avoid we are fighting that and it fights against us right? and you know because we do live in a physical world uh things this is this is the way things happen and we have to deal with that right how do we deal with this well here's okay well here's another uh example of a crosstalk here is a beautiful nice and pleasant conversation between this person and that person so here's the wire all right and here's another conversation between two wonderful people as well and some of the wires are running along each other then the crosstalk can happen 
in analog uh, situation. If this is another, which, you know, POTS, uh, plain old telephone service, uh, is an analog type of a transmission. Right. Now, in an analog transmission, crosstalk can be annoying, but you can still carry on. Yes, you're going to be hearing the other conversation. Yes, if you're watching a ball game on TV and some with the within an analog transmission, uh, the uh, some other channel is cutting through. Yes, it's going to be annoying watching the ball game when some sort of a cooking show trying to cuts in, but you're going still going to be able to see who won or what actually happened. That's in analog transmission. Digital completely uh, yes, crosstalk does happen in digital, but the effects are completely different. All right, now crosstalk. Here I'm going to encourage you or ask you to watch this little short video. It's like, look, it's three minutes after you download this presentation. And if you don't have ability to download, just type the whole line here and into the address bar of uh, your favorite browser and you should be fine. Uh, this is extreme, uh, showing the digital um, crosstalk. And what happens with digital? Basically, what happens is this. When you have a analog crosstalk, yes, things are going to be cutting through each other, but you'll still be able to see it's going to be annoying, but you'll still be able to, at some point, you'll be able to... Uh, now, if the other signal is just too strong, yes, it's going to take over the channel. But, uh, but if it's just cutting in and out, it's, you'll still be able to see the original content low quality but it's still going to be able to with digital it's completely different because what happens is when digital uh crosstalk well let's say first of all it's established what's a digital transmission a digital transmission is transmitting ones and zeros uh from one end to another okay and then when you transmit those ones and zeros, you're going to transmit them in a timely manner. So the timing is going to be crucial. So the transmitter is going to say, is going to, because you know, everything has something that's called a propagation delay, which means the delay, the time that uh, takes uh, for the signal to get from one end of the circuit to another or from one end of the cable to another. So <clears throat> we can't just synchronize the transmitter and the receiver in some sort of a uh, well synchronized way as far as uh, at the same time. But what we can do is we can set the clock on the transmitter and we can set the clock on the receiver and those clocks are going to be ticking in the same manner. They're going to be just equally fast or slow the speed of the clock of the transmitter and the speed of the clock the clock is going to provide timing reference so the timing reference in the transmitter and the timing reference in the receiver are going to be the same so all we have to do then is send an or just like a start some sort of a beginning signal letting the tr receiver know that okay start listening now and since you are at the same speed, you're going to recognize the bits. At the same speed that I'm transmitting, you should have no problem understanding what I'm saying. So bang, here's the transmitting, uh, the start listening signal, and then the receiver starts listening, and it's going to interpret the ones and zeros at the exact same time, not exact same time, in the same time manner right, as the receiver with the same speed. So the transmitter is going to listen with the same speed that the transmitter is transmitting. Now, what happens when we have crosstalk? If we have crosstalk, we're going to have some of the ones and zeros from another line that's beside this line bleeding through. So the receiver is going to see some extra ones and zeros. And in digital, it's a complete disaster because in digital you're going to see another you know just more information than it's looking for and the transmission is going to completely fail 
right? There's not going to be annoying interference. No, this is going to be a complete nothingness, right? It's, the receiver is going to say, no, I don't know what this thing is. Uh, I'm shutting down. So this little three-minute video is showing that. Right? Now, this is a complete, uh, I would say, extreme uh, when it comes to that. But yes, it can happen. However, when, uh, uh, you know, I just... Just don't get some wrong ideas because if you look at this here, the first picture that we had, this one here, you have a bunch of wires running beside each other. So the interference should be just immense, right? But And nothing should work according to that video if you get things that close. Now, don't get me wrong, that video is correct. It is a good video, uh, but it is showing, it's demonstrating because the signal had to be strong enough to interfere with the other line. Um, and that, uh, that video is uh, presenting the differences between shielded data cable and non-shielded or unshielded data cable uh, in order to show that, uh, yes, the crosstalk can be remedied in, sort of, in this sort of way. So I'm just clicking through the slides here. All right. So that brings us to something uh, that is called unshielded, but here, here's the thing, twisted pair. Right, now, um, you are probably noticing that we are really, really, are really hard on your case to keep, when we're doing the labs, we are really, really strict about keeping the twist or not untwisting any of the pairs and keeping the twist right as far as we can go to the point of connection. So that's the reason for it, right? The twist, so this is unshielded twisted pair versus shielded twisted pair. See, here's a shield, shielding, providing additional protection against crosstalk. Now, Unshielded twisted pair is pretty much the bread and butter of data installations or data infrastructure installations. Uh, believe it or not, shielded, uh, shielded twist was actually the idea of Mr. Alexander Graham Bell. Because in telephony, crosstalk was, well, a problem. They discovered, yeah, crosstalk happens. Like, well, magnetic interference between lines. And if you have a lot of them, then some of them could be running along each other for distance that is long enough for the magnetic field to have certain strength and ability to bleed through another pair. But what Mr. Bell has discovered was that if you twist the pair, the magnetic field is not as constant. It's scattered all over the place. So it doesn't have the strength to affect the other wire. And if you have another pair that is also twisted beside the other one, then it is even there's even less chance of that wire to be affected, of the pair to be affected by the magnetic field. Because not only the original pair is twisted, so there is no straightness along the wire, plus the magnetic field is not equal, it's not constant, it's just pointing all over the place, so it doesn't have some sort of, uh, you know, it doesn't have strength to affect the other uh, pair. Now, notice that the pairs are also twisted at different rate. So, not only one pair is twisted, the other pair is twisted, it's twisted at different rate, so there is even less chance for the crosstalk to happen because there's not there's even because well you could have two pairs running along each other and the twists could align so it's just like having two straight wires beside each other but no let's let's get that now cat5e 
would stop at that. Now, when there's cat 6, so that's how we can tell that this is cat 6, this wire is cat 6, because cat 6 has this plastic insert, a separator, inserted inside the cable, and each pair has its own kind of groove to go along, so not only the pairs are twisted, pairs are twisted at different rates, and if that wasn't enough, all the pairs, as, I go, as they're going along, they're also twisted around each other by the means of this separator. See, this separator is twisted. CAT5E doesn't have that, but CAT5E um, is capable of, uh, of much less transfer speed. CAT6 is more efficient cable, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, so, there's additional... Uh, so this is, you see how sensitive things are to physical structure, and if you're binding this thing with some sort of a zip tie, and you, you put them nice and tight, uh, then you're actually going to affect, uh, affect the physical structure, and what can happen? Well, crosstalk can happen. So, unshielded. Let's forget that for now. Here's twisted pair. And this is unshielded. So UTP, unshielded twisted pair. The purpose of the twist is, the main purpose of the twist in the pairs is to minimize or lessen the chance of a crosstalk. Can crosstalk happen anyways? Somehow it can, but if you do take all those preventative measures, chances are slim. So here's an example of Anchila twisted pair. Now let's take a look, take a look at. Uh, oh, okay. So the purpose of the cross, the twist, is to eliminate crosstalk between the pairs. Now here's a shielded twisted pair. What did I say about that? Shielded twisted pair. Twisted pair and it's shielded. Well, shielded twisted pair has shield around it. Now there are different types of shields different type of shielding. You can have a shield <clears throat> that is just common to all the pairs. You can have a shield on each pair, like here. Or you can have shield on each pair, and on top of that, it could be wrapped around with one common shield as well, like a double whammy. And over here, is a just a bare wire serving as a well sometimes they call it screen wire or a drain wire it's a ground wire it's connected to the shielding and if you're using if you when you're terminating the shielded twisted pair that also has to find its way into a connector but we're not going to terminate shielded twisted pair in our labs we're just going to get comfortable with unshielded twisted pair of course, this takes a long, well, the, the shielded twisted pair is more expensive cable. It takes longer to install because you have to deal with undoing the shield and connecting the shield properly and making sure that, 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 that. Uh, where would you find this type of a, where would you need that? Normally, when you're installing just a regular type of a network infrastructure, cabling, from patch panel, you're running cables in a star topology, uh, which means every every uh, desktop location or whatnot home runs to the LAN room, right to the patch panel. Um, most of the time, you're going to, to to use unshielded twisted pair, and that's fine. However, in some industrial applications, when you have to run wires uh, close to some noisy devices uh, within the machines, when there's a lot of electric motors involved, when there's a lot of relays involved, and you know, that will be usually if you're set wiring uh, for uh, some control signals uh, to uh, within some sort of automated uh, production line then you're going to have to use the shielded twisted pair. 
Okay? Because of the outside interference from uh, whatever runs beside it. And usually this would be electric motors, relays, electromagnets, and things like that. All right, let's see here. Next slide here. All right, before we move on, let's explain what CCA is. <coughs> because we're going, excuse me, we're going to use this acronym in the next slide. CCA stands for copper clad aluminum. Or if you're in UK, it will be aluminium. Right. Uh, what is it? Well, for the most part, copper is the sort of best conductor that we can use in mass production. Actually, the best conductor is silver, but we're not going to use silver. Next thing would be gold. We're not going to use gold because everybody would be, you know, <laughs> there would be so many thefts, everybody would be breaking in and stealing the wiring. <laughs> They're breaking in and stealing the wire uh, made of copper. If that's, you know, if, can you imagine what would be if the wire was made of gold? Actually, silver, silver is better conductor, but silver tarnishes. And gold is the next best uh, conductor, but it's sort of better because it, it just stays clean. It doesn't tarnish. But anyways, uh, we already have had an experience with this uh, type of copper clad aluminum when the wrong cable was involved. But, well, it worked out to our advantage because you were able to actually see how bad that thing is. What happens, some companies to save the cost and somebody thought it was a great idea, you know, sometimes how that goes, is that, yeah, well, aluminum is cheaper, so let's make those uh, aluminum wires and we're just gonna clad, cover them, cladding is covering, uh, with, with copper, so those are going to be aluminum wires pretending that they're copper. And, you know, we should be fine, right? And we all have seen in our labs how that works. If you see that, seriously, yes, it's going to be way less expensive. So let's say if a box of wire, 1,000 foot, uh, thousand foot box, that includes 1,000 feet of wire, let's say bare copper, true copper, not all that aluminum covered with copper, uh, let's say it costs three hundred dollars. Then maybe CCA it was going to cost you hundred dollars. Oh yeah, well you buy that, and then that means that the regular box that you're going to buy anyways is going to cost you four hundred dollars because you're still going to have to spend three hundred dollars on the regular stuff or the good stuff, and you already spend uh, that hundred dollars of on wire that you can pretty much toss in the garbage. All right, so let's see here. I would encourage you to keep this, just have this thing printed somewhere and uh, keep that on your cell phone, keep that image. It's a very, very useful image here. Let's see what this one, uh, what, what we have here. Over here, we have different types of cables. So here's CAT5, which is kind of obsolete right now. You can still use it for some control signals or whatnot, but it's actually hard to buy anymore. Cat five E is still going strong. It's uh, is the work is the workhorse uh, of the infrastructure industry, and it's probably still the most common one that's being used. It's being pried out by Cat six, but that could be deceiving, and I'll explain what's going on. Then there's Cat six A. Uh, so Cat five Cat five E E stands for enhanced. Then we have CAT6, the specifications are going up. And then we have CAT6A, and A stands for amended, uh, and amended is basically enhanced. Right? Uh, and then we have CAT7, 7A, and da, 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 you just keep going. And then when you, once you go to CAT7, 7A, you might as well consider maybe we should get fab, uh, fiber optics uh, instead of copper right? for the price or whatnot. Right? But, Okay, let's see what we have on this table here. Now, here's the American wiring gauge. So here's the gauge of the, that tells us the thickness of each conductor. 
So here's 24 gauge, 24 gauge. Oh look, cut six goes 23. So it's a thicker conductor being used from cut six. Then over here, we're going to have the twist, <coughs> the twist pitch or twist rate, excuse me. So cut five, well, has a little bit of twist. Cut, cut three, which is the stuff that we're working on, uh, this 24, 2024 class, uh, just so happens that the lab that we're performing right now is the cut three telephone 25 pair. So it has even less twist. Cat5 is going to have more consistent twist. Cat5e, even more consistent, tighter twist. You see, as the specifications go up, the twist tightens. And I already showed you what the difference is between Cat5e and Cat6. How can you tell that you have, you're dealing with Cat6? Besides that, you can actually read the label that is printed along the cable every so many feet. Uh, then we go into transfer speed, bandwidth, these two, we're going to take care of that later. <coughs> All right, transfer speed and the bandwidth. See, look at the units. The bandwidth is specified in megahertz. And you see here I put it in bracket. 1000 megahertz, which is 1 gigahertz. But... It just so happens that within telecommunications, this, the, the bandwidth is talked, usually talked about within the units of megahertz. Yes, 1000 megahertz is 1 gigahertz, but uh, you're going to hear 1000 megahertz instead of 1 gig. Or sometimes, you know, you can hear 1 gig, that's fine. All right? There's no hard rule. Nobody's going to go to jail if you switch these two terms, as long as... You're correct with it, oh, and you still won't go to jail if <laughs> you make a mistake. Although, you know, I shouldn't say that, <coughs> depending on what happens when you make a mistake. Uh, all right. So here's the difference between bandwidth and transfer speed. Let's look at this CAT5 cable here. CAT5 has a bandwidth of 100 megahertz, which means you can, the, that cable can transmit a signal that would have a carrier and you might want to find out what carrier is a carrier frequency is a frequency that the transmitter is going to tune to the receiver or the receiver is going to tune to whatever the transmitter transmits it's just like tuning radio station to certain frequency and then some other things are happening that they're putting onto that carrier being modulated and you get the information like for example human voice or music going through the radio or data yeah. so in analog or sort of like radio frequency this cable is able to handle 100 megahertz and still have an structurally understandable transmission from one end to the other. If you go above that, chances are that the signal is going to either be absorbed or disappear or become less or funny things can happen. So if you transmit more than 100 megahertz on CAT5, the signal might not be in readable shape on the other end of the cable. And then we get to something that's called uh, transfer speed. And see, the units are different. This one is in megahertz, so it's a frequency because this, is the, this has to do with the analog transmission along that. Now, this transfer speed has to do with the digital transmission along the wire. So if there's an analog signal, this is the top it can handle. And if it's a digital transmission, this is the top that it can handle. Digital transmission are ones and zeros, but those ones and zeros, usually they're produced, they're uh, presented in some sort of a rectangular kind of a thing. But in reality, things are being pushed to the limits. So the ones and zeros, they look like pretty much almost like spikes that are supposed to occur 
at the same at, at, at certain time and they're being spaced time wise along the transmission line so the receiver can listen at the same speed that transmitter is transmitting and that's how we can so we're just being pushed to the limits that those almost become spikes and the spikes are going to be a little bit smaller and smaller as the as the speed goes until the signal is not understood at the other end then say okay well you know we can't transmit that fast so a reliable i don't want to use the word reliable because there is a reliable and unreliable transmission that has nothing to do with good or wrong, good or bad but um, <clears throat> in that sense reliable it's like under uh, it is possible to transmit up to 100 megabits per second in cat 5 And notice that we are saying when it comes to speed, we are going to say bits per second. Bits per second. How many bits? Per, and bit is just one bit. Uh, when it comes to storage, like hard drive storage, we are talking about bytes or megabytes, or gigabytes, or terabytes, and things like that. And there is no per second, because storage is storage. If you really want to be stubborn and say per time, well, how long is it going to last? Is it going to last 50 years before it disappears from the whatever it's on, as far as hard drive? Well, not, all right? But when it comes to storage, we're talking bytes and we're and when it comes to transfer speed we're talking about bits per second so cat 5 is able to carry 100 megabits per second which in number it's kind of similar to 100 megahertz right now <clears throat> when we talk about cat 5 e enhanced the gauge of the same gauge of the conductors we have a bit of tighter twist. Oh, we can transmit up to one gig. One gigabit per second. All right. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at the bandwidth. The bandwidth of cat 5 e can be 100 megahertz, which is the same as the CAT5, if we are using the CCA, which you're not going to use that, right? Right, because, well, we have used that. This thing is just basically dissolved in our hands as we are punching it. Uh, but that's why I explained what the CCA is. And the bandwidth of that CAT5 E cable is 350 megahertz if it's bare copper. So you see, over here these numbers are the same. Over here, the bandwidth has a different number. Hertz they don't equal to, and it has to do with that. Uh, this is different type of modulation is being used with digital transmission and analog transmission. So here's the specifications. One gigabit, well, if you're installing um, Ethernet network cabling, you are going to be interested in this transfer speed. Because the transmission within the LAN room, on this side of the modem, within the building, is all digital. On the other side, we're going to care about bandwidth. Right? But when we're installing LAN, situations we're interested in the transfer speed i just want you to know something like that exists right here all right now <clears throat> the maximum distance of end-to-end -end transmission link of cat 5 is 300 feet 300 feet for cat 5e 300 feet so you don't get any more than 300 feet now sometimes you get even less Right. It's actually 328 feet. But 
If you install an end-to-end -end link, one end is terminated at the patch panel on one end, the other end is terminated at the desktop, you still are going to use some connecting cords like patch cables. So you, you have to account for that. Right? Uh, so you don't want to install more than 300 feet end-to-end -end of CAD5. CAD5, e, well, CAD5 you're not going to install anyways. CAD5 e is going to be the least one that you're going to, to expect to, uh, to be installed. Now, things are getting a little bit funnier when we talk about CAD6. And I think we're going to stop at CAD6 here because we're running out of time. And uh, we're going to pick it up next time we see each other. However, I want you to get this right now. So don't leave yet. Right? Here's CAD6. CAD6 is way, way less forgiving when it comes to keeping the twist to the punch. Extremely sensitive. And extremely more sensitive as far as handling. Don't step on those wires. If you're laying those wires uh, on the floor because you're in the middle of pulling and you're doing some junction pull box and uh, you know you need to pull some slack here and pick it up and pull into another pipe, if you have those wires laid on the uh, uh, on the floor, then have someone standing there and making sure nobody steps on it on the construction site. Uh, are we doing lab six today for section B? Uh, just look at the um sections in the um, i'll show you okay just stay after that uh all right so cat six here thicker conductor because the gauge goes uh from 24 to 23 you got a more consistent twist or tighter twist and arrange certain way transfer speed here's the thing Here's what I want you to carry out from this class. Here's the punchline of this one. One gigabit per second up to 300 feet. So why on earth would you want to buy? Because look, these are the same. One gigabit per second, one gigabit per second. Is cut six better? Oh yeah. Well, let's get cut six. It's going to be so much more expensive. Well, here's the, here's the trick to that. To that one to know cat 6 can carry 10 times faster speed but only if the link is up to 180 feet see here's that thing so if somebody wants to buy if you're designing a network and somebody wants to buy cat 6 because cat 6 is better well you're going to go and do a little bit of a survey you're going to find out how long are those transmission links because they add up you run the wire in the wall to get to the ceiling and across the ceiling and down so every little distance they just add up so you just have to make sure that if somebody wants to get 10 gigabits per second and if they want to buy cat 6 which is more expensive than cat 5e it is going to work only if those links are only up to 180 feet if the runs are longer than 180 feet and you still want the speed then you should bump this, the, 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 the cable to cut 6A amended enhanced then you're going to get 10 gigabits per second for three, full 300 feet Right. just take a look at that this is how you read this table and this is why I say it took me a while to prepare this because uh, I had to gather data information from all, all kinds of sources but here's it all in one place right. keep that it's going to help you along all right so uh, when it uh, okay mm, British are we doing lab 6 today all right let's see the um, where are we here? Here's our class portal. And if you go to content, da 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 da, you go to course outline, and you go to the second document right here, this one. I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on everything here. Yeah. That's the second one, course plan. Scroll down, 
you see here's lab schedule according to subsections so here's our study week that was last week and yes we're doing lab six and this week we're going to accommodate all subsections b and next week all subsections a and so on so just go to, according to that schedule and uh, we should be fine all right and how is it that you can tell which section you are in if you go to the main class portal all the names are listed there oh, come on it's just not happening okay a little bit slow all right so here are the names of the yeah okay cool so this is the uh <clears throat> that's the end of today's class and we'll pick up uh, uh this concept as we go along next time we see each other all right thank you very much guys have a wonderful week